Uh, so today I will be speaking about the creation of the ideal human in the works of the Franciscan polymath, Roger Bacon. Starting from the idea that humans have the potentiality of not dying as demonstrated by the resurrection body, Bacon combined humoral medicine with alchemical theory and practice to argue that humans could extend their lives by several hundred years, approaching the perfection and immortality of the resurrection body. By exploring topics in Bacon's writings, including corporeal and spiritual matter, their relation to form, and the actions of the four elements upon each other, I will argue that Bacon thinks that immortality comes from an equality of the elements, which alchemy can provide. I will also demonstrate that Bacon came up with his ideas by combining and expanding upon a number of different sources. These included not only Aristotelian natural philosophy and Arabic alchemy, but also Franciscan ideas about ecstatic communion and oneness with God, especially in his understanding of why a perfect body was not achievable in this life. Okay. So in order to understand Bacon's alchemical program, it is necessary to understand the context in which he was writing. Bacon was born in southwestern England between the years of 1214 and 1220. His family was wealthy, and he entered the University of Oxford in 1234. After receiving his degree at Oxford, the remainder of Bacon's life can be split into two periods, the first from roughly 1240 to 1250, where he lectured on Aristotle's Libri Naturales at the University of Paris, and the second from 1250 until his death in 1292, in which time he joined the Franciscan order, circa 1257. Part of this time may have been spent in Oxford, although he seems to also have ties with the Franciscans of Paris. Information on the final years of Bacon's life is just as hard to ascertain as for his youth. He died in 1292 and was buried in the Franciscan Cemetery in Oxford. Like many 13th century physicians and natural philosophers, Bacon believed that there were two types of decay, natural and accidental. Accidental decay leads to the current lifespan of 70 to 80 years, while a person who avoided accidental decay had a significantly longer lifespan, much like the biblical patriarchs who lived well over six centuries. Bacon saw the difference between natural and accidental decay as largely one of speed, rather than there being a fundamental difference in how this decay actually occurred. As the decay of the 13th century man was accidental and not mandated by God or nature, it was remediable, thus allowing Bacon to claim that life could be extended. Because this accidental decay was the result of human failings rather than divine laws, it can be remedied using human sciences and tools such as alchemy. However, man cannot reach immortality in this life because there is a second limit to life that is set by God, which man cannot pass. Now in theory, the art of medicine should be able to extend human life, but in practice it cannot because doctors are ignorant of alchemy. In his more mature works on the subject, Bacon divides alchemy into two types, practical and speculative. In the medical context, practical alchemy teaches how to make medicines more safe and efficacious. Many medicines contain harmful components and alchemical techniques provide a means of removing these gross materials, leaving only the beneficial aspects. Bacon envisioned using the techniques, sometimes called keys of alchemy, such as distillation, sublimation, and resolution to improve these medicines. Speculative alchemy, on the other hand, teaches about the generation of all things from the four elements. Bacon believed that the four traditional elements of fire, air, water, and earth combined together to form the four simple humors, blood, phlegm, bile, and melancholy. Each humor contained all four elements, but was dominated by one, and that determined its characteristics. The four simple humors then combined in a similar manner to form the four complex humors, which are conveniently also called blood, phlegm, bile, and melancholy. <laughs> when physicians speak of the four humors, they are referring to these four complex humors. 
speculative alchemy, oh, as all things in the sublunary world, organic and inorganic, are made from four humors. And as speculative alchemy thus not teaches only about the generation of the human body, but about the generation of all things and how they interact. Bacon believed that speculative alchemy, when combined with practical alchemy, allowed one to separate the constituent elements and recombine them in new proportions, thus altering the substance. Speculative alchemy also teaches about the incorruptibility of materials, that is, a state in which a substance was unable to be altered or experience decay. To Bacon, incorruptibility of materials came from a corpus equale, or a body of equal complexion. In such a body, all of the elements would be in perfect proportion, not by weight, but by strength, and thus the body would not decay as the prime matter had been joined to the proper form of equal complexion. There were three substances that have this equal complexion, gold, which has it naturally, the resurrection body, which will be given by God after the last judgment, and substances created through alchemy and experimental science. This meant that in theory, alchemy could teach how to make a body incorruptible, thus extending human life. Much of Bacon's interest in alchemical theories and their application to medicine came from reading the pseudo Avicennian De Anima. However, Bacon's understanding of how incorruptibility occurred signified a significant break from this tradition, which taught that all things on earth have their own ratio of the elements as exemplified by a certain proportion of the four qualities, hot, cold, wet, and dry. Bacon applied this theory to human medicine while also significantly expanding upon it and incorporating themes from other sources. As Sebastian Moro has shown in his study of De Anima, if the elixir from De Anima is applied to humans, then a hypothetical patient could have a humoral qualitative composition of 0.3 to 0.7 to 0.4 to 0.1 up here. Uh, his remedy would have to be made of a simple or compound drug that had a qualitative composition of 0.7 to 0.3 to 0.6 to zero. This would create a balanced system of one to one to one to one, where the balance of humors is restored and the patient returns to a state of health. But this means that for every person or disease, there must be a specific remedy with the opposing qualities that can balance out the patient's state. Bacon, on the other hand, believed that there was a universal elixir for health and turned the elixir found in De Anima into a corpus equale that was itself incorruptible as its elements were in the perfect proportion already, a ratio of one to one to one to one. Not only could such an elixir be used on a person of any complexion to restore their body to health, but it could also be used to heal metals as the state of incorruptibility was identical for both animate and inanimate objects. All that was required was that the elements be in perfect proportion so that there would be no action of one element upon the other. I argue that the idea of a corpus equale is central to Bacon's understanding of how alchemy can serve medicine. Alchemy provides the tools for creating the corpus equale, which can then cure any disease thus obviating the need for diagnoses or prognosis. Additionally, as the corpus equale is found in the resurrection body, a body cured by Bacon's corpus equale will approximate, though not reach, a state similar to that found after the resurrection. The equality of elements, and by extension their qualities, did not come from an equality of weight, but from an equality of strength. If they were to be combined by weight, then one element would still dominate the others, as Aristotle teaches in the Metaphysics and De Caelo et Mundi, and thus corruption can still occur. Equal complexion was so important because if the matter had equal complexion, it would not desire a new form. Corruption happened in things because their form was not able to complete the appetite of the matter, which constantly desired a better form. Matter desired the most noble form, which it would receive when it had the equal complexion. At that point, the laws of nature dictated that there would be no motion or operation of the elements upon each other. An example of this was the heavens, 
which had arrived at this equal complexion and so did not change. Once this desired form had been reached, it would not be able to be separated from the matter. Nature was, of course, able to make this body of equal proportion as demonstrated by gold, but it could also be made using art. Where it did not happen naturally was in human bodies. Galen had argued that there was an equality of complexion in the human body. But as Bacon reminds us, Averroes showed that Galen was wrong. Bacon admitted that while a hot and humid complexion could be described as equal with respect to the human condition, it was not a true equality, just the best for human nature. In all other bodies aside from gold, nature needed the help of art to make the corpus equale, as almost all mixed bodies were dominated by one element. Art could help nature separate the elements, reduce them to pure simplicity, and then recombine them so that the active powers were in equality. But while a corpus equale was possible, it was impossible for humans to have the corpus equale in this world, because then they would not have a need for death and the eventual resurrection. So one question that arises from this examination of Bacon's understanding of the corpus equale is this, is there one kind of equality or is equality itself a movable goal adjusted to each individual? Gold has a corpus equale. Does that mean that all bodies after the resurrection will be the same as gold? Bacon agreed that both Aristotle and Avicenna taught that gold was the only item that had the body of equal complexion and was thus incorruptible. If gold did not have equality in its active potential of elements, then it would be corruptible. However, Bacon also says that gold can be made more perfect. In the Opus Maius, Bacon claimed that gold could be made in 30 or even 40 grades surpassing what nature can create on its own. 24, 30, and 40 grade gold were all incorruptible. So Bacon appears to believe in a system of degrees of perfection. Now in terms of human health, this was important as each person had the, their own baseline of health. Traditional medical theory taught that some people were naturally phlegmatic, some were choleric, et cetera, depending on the dominant humor in their body. Did a body of equal proportion bring one person to some ideal state of equality in which each individual had the same equality and thus no one retained their natural dispositions? Or was equality subject to each individual and the corpus equale only brought a person closer to their own ideal individual equality? Bacon did not directly address this question. Uh, and so I cannot point to a specific passage in his works on the prolongatio vitae where this dilemma is answered. However, his works on natural philosophy, namely the communia naturalium and the opus maius, describe the complexions of the heavens and their equalities. So I'll summarize Bacon's arguments on the equalities of the heavens to argue that a similar approach can be taken to the equalities of the human body. That is, there is no one universal equality that fits all humans. In Aristotelian cosmology, the heavens were considered eternal and unchanging. This was generally accepted in the Middle Ages with the caveat that the heavens themselves had been created by God at a point in time, thus making them both generable and incorruptible. Incorruptibility and generability were often held to be incompatible that which was generable should in theory also be corruptible. The major exceptions to this rule were the heavens and the resurrection body, all of which were created by God, but would be eternal. All stars have the same general, but not specific natures. In the Opus Maius, Bacon wrote, there are 1,022 fixed stars of different magnitudes. Stars possess different forces in heat, cold, moisture, dryness, and other qualities and natural changes. Among these stars are the principal ones of the 12 signs by which all things are subject to change. <clears throat> Essentially, the stars were made from the four qualities that make up the substances of the sublunary world. Like the stars, the planets also had different qualities. The malevolent planets, Saturn and Mars, for example, shared the characteristic of being dry, damaging to humans, 
while Jupiter and Venus were benevolent because they were humid. Now, one might argue that the difference is that the stars are of different species, while all humans are of the same species. But this argument does not necessarily invalidate the conclusion that there could be multiple types of equality. The stars each had their own proper proportion of the four qualities. This made them unique in their composition and actions upon the sublunary bodies while simultaneously incorruptible. Individual humans derived their different complexions from the heavens. Each point on earth was at the inverted apex of a pyramid and the celestial bodies that were encompassed in the pyramid influenced the complexion of a body. As every person was born in a slightly different place and was thus at the apex of a slightly different pyramid, no two bodies were the same, not even twins. This complexion followed them for the rest of their life and influenced not only their physical bodies, but also their behaviors. An individual's aptitude towards morals, languages, sciences, arts, and even age are all fixed by the stars. Different stars and zodiac constellations were dominant in different regions, which was why one region of the earth was inclined toward one religion or lifestyle and not another. However, Bacon reminds us, as with anything that involved the human will, the stars provided inclinations, not determinations. The rational soul could be inclined towards something, but it could not be forced. Now, returning to the point at hand, if a corpus equale exists in nature and can be created using art, how exactly can it be used to heal a human body? That is, how can it make something else incorruptible as well? I have argued that Bacon believed a body of equal complexion is able to pass on its equality to a recipient through the multiplication of its species. According to this theory, which Bacon said explains every natural process, a body or agent is able to send out its force or species. The species then enacts a change in the matter of the recipient body, causing it to become something akin to the agent. This is not an emanation from the agent, rather an activation of the potentiality of the matter of the recipient. Because Bacon believed this is not an emanation from the agent, the agent itself does not have to be destroyed. This is important as a body of equal proportion should be incorruptible. Additionally, as Bacon has said that God decreed that only certain things, such as the element of fire, are able to have a complete transformative effect on the matter of the recipient, Bacon is able to claim that a medicine composed of a corpus equale cannot extend human life indefinitely, thus allowing for death and the resurrection. So here you see the species of fire enacts the activation of the potentiality in the matter of the log, which then turns the log itself into more fire. How can Bacon reconcile the multiplication of species which relied on form and potentiality with health, which based on the four humors and their qualities? The species of the qualities and elements were also included in the species of mixture and the species of contraries could either create a mixture or if one was far stronger than the other, could completely destroy the other. Though Bacon never explicitly stated it, it is possible that the thought process behind this was that orthodox medicines work by providing contrary humors and do so through the action of contrary species. A medicine with a body of equal proportions could work by perfecting the potentiality of the recipient matter, that is the elements. So, um, this seeming incommensurability between natural philosophy based on form and matter and one based on the four elements and qualities was not unique to Bacon. As Annalise Meyer has shown in Scholastic Philosophy, material substance was considered either a composite of matter and form or as a compound of the four elements. The question then arose, could a material substance be both a composite and a compound? It did not help that the two theories were favored by different groups. A compound of elements was the theory favored by philosophers, theologians, and physicians, whereas metaphysicians preferred a composite of form and matter. The problem with the elemental theory, at least for the metaphysicians, was that the elements could not be the ultimate building blocks of the natural world because they themselves were a composite of form and primary matter. 
Thus, the elemental forms had to be preserved within the resulting compound, which seemed impossible to reconcile with the idea of a unique compound form. Um, Bacon provides a little insight into his own ideas surrounding this debate in a section of the Opus Minus dealing with alchemy. Here he wrote that all inferior things came from the elements which could themselves be properly called prime material separated from form. The form of a mixture does not come from the elements. He also discussed the opinion of the masters whom he said believed that each element was in potentiality any of the other three. <laughs> However, it was more proper to say that the power of heavens was sufficient for the generation of a mixture and three elements were not required to be present simultaneously in all generation. Sorry, the elements were not required to be present simultaneously in all generation. Something made of the element of earth did not require the nature of earth to remain. To think otherwise was lunacy, for the, if the specific nature remained, then it was not a true mixture. However, Bacon was not just an Aristotelian. There was another equally important tradition that shaped his understanding of the human ideal, and that is the Franciscan tradition of ecstatic communion with God. Bacon's Franciscan status is often separated from his scientific pursuits and scholarship, as though the two did not influence each other. Bacon was interested in the sciences precisely because he thought they would serve the church and make better Christians. While Bacon's understanding of the nature of equality came from Aristotelian natural philosophy, his understanding of the human body and how it could be equal came from Christian doctrine surrounding the resurrection. While Bacon repeatedly stated that a body of equal, oops, something wrong. Uh, while Bacon repeatedly stated that a body of equal complexion would be similar to, but not identical to the resurrection body, there has been little consistent study of how the idea of human incorruptibility after the resurrection gave Bacon ideas about the potential for reduced corruptibility in the here and now. I've argued that many of Bacon's ideas regarding the possibility, as well as the physicality of the post-judgment body come from two sources, sacred scripture, and the Franciscan pseudo-Dionysian tradition, which above all emphasized the study of light. Um, I'm running short on time, yes? Uh, one minute and a half. Okay. Um, so you can ask me more questions about the Franciscans in the question answer period. Um, Bacon attributes, uh, so how, how does Bacon imagine the material present? So, uh, sorry. Um, it is evident that Bacon attributes immortality to an equality of the elements, but such a concept does not appear in the Bible. Instead, the Bible attributes the immortality of the resurrected man to something else, spiritual matter. Spiritual matter and the ways in which it differed from earthly matter provided many with a convenient answer to the problem of material continuity. But for Bacon, it would further complicate the issue. Bacon argued that there were in fact three types of matter, spiritual, sensible, and mediate. So how does Bacon imagine the material body, the material matter of the present body would become the spiritual matter of the resurrection body as is taught in the New Testament? In the section of the Opus Minus found in uh, the Vatican uh, Reg Lat 1317, Bacon described the proper complexion that the body would receive after the resurrection. The stasis or incorruptibility of the body is likened to that of the heavens. The heavens and the resurrection body shared certain fundamental qualities. Both were created by God at a moment in time, yet both were unchanging and incorruptible. The Opus Tertium and Communia Naturalium contain passages that appear to have been built from this section of the Opus Minus. Both stated that generation and corruption were types of motion, and as neither the heavens nor the post-resurrection body would be moving, there would be no generation or corruption. It, the Communia Naturalium also stated that spiritual substances did not have place and thus were neither divisible nor indivisible, which the body required. This, as well as the passage in which Bacon claimed that the animal body would become spiritual, could suggest that he believed the bodies after the resurrection would be made of spiritual matter, not physical matter. But can physical matter be changed into spiritual matter? 
it would seem not. So there is no place where Bacon suggests that this transmutation of matter is possible. So perhaps Bacon didn't think through this conclusion. Alternatively, it may mean that the physical matter of the body will be like spiritual matter in that it will not have place or motion, especially motion of the elements. This is a better explanation for the passage in the Communia Naturalium, considering the aforementioned fact that Bacon never allowed for transmutation between physical and spiritual matter. This option allows a level of continuity in Bacon's thought that the other explanation does not provide. By saying that the equal physical matter was like spiritual matter, Bacon could maintain that there was a physical resurrection of the body and adhere to the principles of continuity of materiality that he and his contemporaries were so interested in preserving. It also allowed him to continue to rely on the idea of a corpus equale. If physical matter were to be transformed into spiritual matter, then there would be no need to maintain a corpus equale, which enables physical matter to be incorruptible. So the incorruptible resurrection body will be given by God, but another incorruptible substance, that is gold, can be found on earth in this lifetime. Alchemy teaches how to make substances incorruptible like gold by balancing out their elements and recombining them in proper proportions, curing all diseases and sustaining the body to the limits allowed in this life. Alchemy therefore provided the best insight into the resurrection body that man can have in this world, aside from knowledge received through divine revelation. Thank you.